Check with Tom. This is our third year already. I can't believe it's been that long. Not a full year, but it's our third startup year. So thank you all for coming out. All the way from the east side, the west side, the north side, the south side, etc. So you're here at D New Tech. Um, our agenda for tonight will have our keynote speaker, which will be Amanda talking about Start Garden. And then we're going to have four presenters tonight. Just to remind everyone of the format, we'll have five minutes if you're a presenter to talk about your business, your proposition, whatever. I will have a timer. Tom is as obnoxious as I am. He will also have a timer, so they'll both go off, so that'll be the signal to stop. Then we'll have five minutes of Q&A, and then we'll go on to the next one. So we'll be finished technically uh, quarter past seven-ish. Uh, everyone generally stays around for a bit afterwards. There are all kinds of munchies out there. So the presenters can stay to get us some more questions afterwards. So we always keep it light and informal. Um, I think everyone found the men's ladies' rooms right outside. There are refreshments out there. So I think we're all set. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank our sponsors, Core Merchant, Text Ripple, Blue Water Angels, Biz to Mew, uh, Tech Town, Mental Note Online, Tons Company, and Quicken Loans. Obviously, we're here at one of the Quicken Loan family of companies, so really excited to be here. Um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. That'll be Amanda Chaco. Uh, Amanda has a very history. She started as the owner. She's a, she's a connected type of person. Uh, so she started with her Ready Set Network back, uh, God, almost a dozen years ago now, it seems, about 10 years ago. She moved to the Holland area. She was director of entrepreneurial development for Lake Show Advantage, which is their business development group. Uh, she became program director of Promigrant Studios and Momentum in, in um, Grand Rapids. And they invite five companies to participate in a 12-week lean startup. Then they make presentations to all the big money investors. And then she's doing something which is unimportant to me called Star Garden. I got invested in by them, so make sure you give her a good applause. The fly. <laughs> so Star Garden is the newest activity. I'm not going to give it away, but it's a really, really cool activity. It's going to get a lot of buzz around the country. Uh, we had an event in Grand Rapids just a week or two ago. We had the CEO of Startup America come out. We were able to introduce him to the Star Garden team. So I, I think this concept will get more visibility. So I'm going to shut up and let Amanda go ahead and take over. Amanda Chaka. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. I'm excited to be back in the uh, As Mel said, I'm here representing Start Garden, which is a new $15 million seed venture fund based in Grand Rapids. It was founded by Rick DeVos, who you may know from Art Prize, Momentum, and uh, more recently, 5x5 Five Five Night. Start Garden is kind of a culmination of all the good things that we pulled out of those three initiatives. Uh, so we invest in two ideas a week at $5,000 each. Ideas can come from anywhere and can range anywhere from internet technology to physical products. Ideas that we, I should say that we started the fund with these really, really early stage investments because we believe that before a region can be really friendly to startups, first has to be friendly to new ideas and support those ideas at those experimental stages. So ideas are submitted to startgarden.com and each week two ideas are chosen, one by the Start Garden team and one by the general public. So those of you that are ambitious can submit your idea and start campaigning and get out the votes. Companies that are funded the $5,000 have 60 to 90 days to come back to Grand Rapids and do a public presentation and tell us how they spent that money. We believe that all ideas uh, start out, or well, companies start out based on assumptions, and we would like the money to be used to test one of those assumptions. So the questions that we ask the teams uh, behind the ideas to answer at the update night are, what was your original hypothesis? What was the experiment that you conducted? What were the results of that experiment? How are you going to move forward? And of course, why uh, should we continue to fund you? From there, teams can get anywhere from 20, 50 up to $500,000 in investment. We use a stair-step approach, invest incrementally as they test assumptions as they go along. Um, we also invest in later stage deals with other investors as well. Um, 
We also believe that it takes three types of capital to help launch an idea into a startup. Of course, financial and also intellectual capital and social capital. So the Start Garden team acts as a concierge to the people and resources in the whole entire region, the whole state of Michigan, and beyond that. We have our different partners, especially now since we've gotten into products. We have a lot of manufacturing companies, design companies, product development. We have expertise in marketing and design, technology, and, and the list goes on. So we've really um, expanded our network over the years. And we are really excited that we're going to be opening up our space, which is going to be in downtown Grand Rapids. That is happening September 15th. It's going to be sort of a, a clubhouse for startups. It's not really a co-working space. It's not an incubator, but it's a place for startups and startup enthusiasts to, to come in and have happy accidents and meet each other, attend our events. We have a monthly happy hour for the startup community. Of course, our update nights. We're going to have all kinds of education, ranging from basic business to lean startup methodologies, human-centered design technology, whatever the community needs. We're, we're going to really try to build the network so we have enough expertise to cover just about any challenge or situation that, that entrepreneurs run into. So we really don't know what the next innovations will be, so that's why we built a platform for um, ideas to, to grow into companies, and that's Start Garden. I should say that we uh, launched in the end of April, and we've um, funded over 40 companies so far. Of course, you've heard uh, Field is one of those companies, along with a number of uh, Quite a few other Detroit companies. We get we get um, submissions from Detroit and Ann Arbor and throughout the state. We've invested in companies from outside of the state as well, and we've made um, we've had two update nights where we've made ongoing investments of uh, twenty and fifty thousand dollars. Oh, so you're only in Grand Rapids, or do you have any other affiliate offices? No, we don't have any offices, but you know the the physical spaces in Grand Rapids. We travel, like the rest of the team tonight is doing a big happy hour in uh, Kalamazoo tonight, we have an event, so we'll kind of be like a take, take it on the road type thing, but um, the, the only um, obligation to being in Grand Rapids is coming for that update night, but of course we're trying to, you know, to build the, the ecosystem so the, the more people that are around, the more that are feeding each other, the, the better, so we are encouraging that physical presence when, when companies can. Can you give us a success story example of one of your $5,000 investments? Um, sure. Well, keep in mind, we've only been up and running for a few months, so there's only so much success. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, or at least, at least what their update was. When they yeah, started. yeah. So one of the companies that we funded um, is, um, this is why I need notes, because my brain doesn't work. Under pressure. Um, the shoe insert? Yeah, the shoe. So what was the name of it? Yeah, now, I know. Uh, I remember. Okay. There's a really good press article on, on the Detroit uh, Free Press what was the about this company. Yeah, it's a shoe insert for uh, children's soccer shoes. Um, so because there's a lot of injuries. I know my son used to get this big lump on his knee, and it was called some oxymoron thing. I don't know. Um, but this is for, it's to help um, kids just to have these inserts as they get new shoes to insert them. And we partnered um, them up with Wolverine, because uh, that seemed to be a natural fit for them because they already had experience um, and expertise in, in that domain. And they, they're going on to uh, create prototypes and, um, and getting into a few test markets as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Design. <laughs> She's creating uh, custom wedding gowns, like kind of pieces, so brides can come in and try on <coughs> different pieces of gowns and kind of create their own Frankenstein <laughs> wedding gown. <laughs> it's, it's a lot nicer than that. Are, are there any limits in terms of revenue or uh, time as a business or anything like that in terms of getting involved? No. Uh, many of our ideas are back of the napkin. I think so. You know, you know, one idea is chosen by the public, so 
you know, and those those ideas tend to be food and beer related. You know, you notice that as you go through. Um, and we, we tried, we realized that these are really, really raw, early stage, back of the napkin ideas, and we're not looking for, you know, a really obvious revenue model, but we're looking for something interesting that has potential, and that, that, uh, that first $5,000 investment for us is really a way for us to get to know the entrepreneur behind the idea, see how resourceful they are, and how are they going to spend that money um, to move their idea forward. So that that's where that that comes in. Well, the question I have for you is, Amanda, when you put these ideas out on a weekly basis, on average, how many people from the public participate in voting on them? Um, I don't know the exact count. It's it, it's Okay, like we probably have like a thousand people that that check in on the site. It's one thing we're working on as we're going along is you know, how to get the public more involved, how to get them to keep coming back to the site and um, being incentivized to continue to vote on and ideas. And it, it's been pretty good, but we like to see those numbers go up. Will you guys speak up? Can you speak up louder because Roger is trying to get the audio to I'll post the people in the back. Yes. Is there any follow up with those who don't win? So the way it works is at the update night, you there, there, there are going to be three outcomes. So we're trying to be really, really transparent because most of the time these decisions are made behind closed doors and, and the public doesn't really know about it. So these update nights, uh, we, we hear the update from the entrepreneurs and then we have a panel uh, of our team members that will tell them, you know, either yes, you are going to be continued to fund it, to be funded. Uh, not yet, and this is what we'd like to see from you, or no, come back again with something else. Um, funded companies have automatic membership to Start Garden. So during that period, we encourage people, you know, now that we have our space to come into the space and we make the connections that we make and try to stay connected that way. We continue to stay connected to our funded companies. The not yet companies get a month extension where they can come back something, I guess, that, that might help us to, to change our minds. But everyone's always welcome to stay. And we haven't yet had to, to ban somebody from from Starcraft. And we have lots of events that people can participate in. We haven't seen those yet. You haven't given you all this update yet. You could ban me. They'll probably ban me. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, Jim, you have a question? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to know if you submit yeah, on an ongoing basis, if you don't. The ideas the for the week are announced on Thursday around noon, and the slate is cleared, and people can resubmit at that time. You can submit up to three times. And then I think you have to wait like three months before you can submit again. If I can throw something in here, I'm a perfect example of that. Talked with the staff, went through all the stuff, submitted. I was not chosen, I was crushed. I went through therapy for a couple years, got my mojo back again, resubmitted, and I was selected for an investment. So you do, they, are, they do encourage you. If you like your idea, don't just go away. Be and we, fine and come on back. We have open office hours on Monday, so people can come in. You know, we meet with our funded companies at that time, but people will come in and, and just you know, tell us about their idea before they submit it. And, and some, sometimes that's really helpful, and we get to know that person, like, yeah, you know, but then sometimes it's not. That person probably would have been better off not coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, so it could really go either way. What about feedback? Do you give them feedback even if they succeed or not succeed? Yes, we get feedback, and, that, and that's what I'm talking about, transparency. When we're at that update event, we would tell a person exactly why we're not investing in them for, for everyone you know, to hear. You know, because we want to educate the public too on what we're looking for in ideas. You know, it's not always based on food and beer. Um, and also to, to give the other team some feedback to, to learn as well. Amanda, can I throw in one comment? Two dates to keep in mind. The second Thursday of every month from 5 to 7 is Start Garden Happy Hour. If you go on to startgarden.com, you'll see it. And they, they encourage people, just come on out. Just sort of mingle with the staff and other participants and whatnot. Then the last Thursday of every month is when Miss they have the update. And they'll have eight, ten companies do their updates. They'll have a break. And they'll actually have a panel of Rick DeVos and three other staff members. 
and they will discuss the company, what they liked, what they didn't like, and then give that feedback right there. So it's very different from other types of forums. Um, Follow-up question. The types of submissions, are they from companies that would be starting off that idea, or are they from companies who are maybe on one trajectory but are looking to test a potential diversification or another branch? It varies. You know, typically, people that have money invested already in their idea or um, you know, are already generating revenue can bypass that $5,000 stair step, that entryway. But any idea that is still not proven, has no funding, has no customers, has to come through that $5,000 uh, gate. So it, it varies, you know, you, you know if, you, if you already have $100,000 invested in your idea by an investor, you're probably not gonna go and take a $5,000 investment and bring on another investor, so. Yeah, How does that work in terms of the investment? What, by percentage? So the $5,000 investment, so we've been tweaking this as we go, because we're a startup too, right? So we're, we're learning um, a lot as we go. Um, so the $5,000 agreement right now is, you know, if the idea, if you don't get funded, you don't owe anything, you know, it's $5,000 less it. Um, if you um, get funded, in the next round, that $5,000 agreement goes away and then it goes, anything $20,000 and above goes into a convertible, you know. And then, unless we have other investors involved, and then it depends on the terms of that whole, um, that whole deal. Um, if you go so on- debt, originally. Yeah, it's originally convertible debt. Yeah. And, then, um, and then it'll convert at the next round of funding when other, you know, other investors come in. If you don't take funding from us, but you want, we get, a right to come along on the next round of investment. So if you're going to a seed accelerator or some other investment, we have the right to invest as a partner in that. Yes. And I guess my, my question relates to your... Speak up just a little bit, please. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I, I've looked at the, uh, uh, in terms of, I'm a couple steps down the road in, uh, in terms of uh, my startup. And so I'm not just someone with an idea who might uh, $5,000. Um, so what ex A, what exactly is the threshold for having to take $5,000 initial investment or be able to surpass it? And B, um, I, I've looked at the term, the kind of term sheet for the $5,000 and, you know, converts to 3%. It doesn't anymore. You have to look at the new one. And information, right? But that, you're saying that's dated now. Yeah. Okay. There's no longer a 3% conversion. Okay. Uh, but so, you know, if, if, if if you're, what's the cutoff for having to do the 5,000? Because, you know, it sounds like if you're the person with idea, you can do that, but if you've got a little bit more, if you got more than that. There's no, there's no set standard for that. Many of the ideas that we that have bypassed that step, for the most part, had other investment already, in the year. they had a, a good amount of traction. Um, if we don't know you at all, we're gonna want you to Go, unless you have other investment, we're going to want you to go through that five thousand dollars step because that's how we start building our relationship with you. And it's only you know a three month process before then you know you can go on to get more investment. Yes. So max amount of investment. Um, we say we invest up to five hundred thousand dollars in one idea. Any other questions? Yeah. Just long term, you're going to be a general VC firm. Yeah. And have you converted on any of the? I mean, I know it's been a really short period of time. Have you, have you bumped up to the second round on anything so far? Yeah. So we've had two update nights. The first um, update night, we had um, three three investments at twenty thousand dollars, and then the second update night, we did a twenty thousand. No, the first update, we did a twenty thousand and a fifty thousand, and then the second one, we did three twenty. Okay. I think if we keep moving along because we're doing good on time, I think Amanda can stay till the yeah, end I'll be and answer a few questions. more questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Second mile is the name of the insert, Joel. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> a little delayed reaction. Yeah. Have a seat. While Marlo is getting the computer hooked up. No audio? Yeah. Uh,
Um, Marlo Rencher is going to talk about Good Sweat, a unique piece of background. She's completing her PhD in business anthropology. I'm going to have to talk with her later to see exactly what that one is. So hopefully, knock on wood, in December, she'll have her PhD. And then something about the business. She's a finalist for the Entrepreneur U Business Plan Competition, sponsored by the Michigan Women's Foundation. That competition will be held in October. So um, trying to increase the no number of women that are involved in their startup. So Marlon, go on ahead and we'll be ready. Tyler and I will both set our timers for five minutes. Good evening, everybody. My name is Marlon Rencher, and I'm the CEO of Good Sweat. Good Sweat helps people raise more money and awareness for the causes they love. We're a social fundraising site that's focused on charity sports participants. And the reason Good Sweat exists is because there's a need and a niche to be addressed right now. This is Matthew Lottie. Matthew's a 46-year-old amateur business or amateur runner and a UK businessman. He decided to do something really extraordinary. What he decided to do was run 100 marathons in 100 days. He did the stutter, it's actually what he wanted to do. 100 marathons in 100 days. And he did this extraordinary thing because a very close friend of his died from stomach cancer, and he promised that friend on his deathbed that he would raise 100,000 pounds to do it. And sure enough, on April 11th of this year, because that's actually Matthew, he ran his 100th marathon and he did it with the fastest time ever. Now he did this really extraordinary thing, but this is the site that he used to support this heroic thing. Unfortunately, this site does not tell the story. And that's not Matthew's fault. The problem is every time people are, I mean a lot of the times people are running, racing, swimming, whatever for a cause, their sites don't tell as powerful a story as the thing it is that they're trying to do. And a lot of times they have a very, very personal connection to this thing. So that's where Good Sweat comes in. Good Sweat is really about connecting people in a very unique way, in a very active and um, dynamic way to the causes that they love. A really, really simple site that's about the people who are running, racing, even jump roping and pogo sticking for their cause. Now, Good Sweat is a crowdfunding site that's designed to help people who are traditionally, or who are participating in traditional events. If they're doing the Susan G. Komen Race for the Cure, you can create your own event on Good Sweat and definitely be supported that way. But the innovation with Good Sweat is that you can create your own custom events. Let's say you just wanted to swim, or again, pogo stick or jump rope for a particular cause. You can create your own event, you can connect it directly to a nonprofit organization, and you can send that event out to your social network. Very simply, very easily, and very powerfully. Connecting it with videos and updates. Now you might ask yourself, why are we focusing on charity sports participants? Two reasons, it's really about volume and validation. 11 and a half million people participated last year in charity sports events. 11 and a half people, million people ran, run, I mean ran, swam, walked for a cause last year. And that's only in the top 30, the local versions of the top 30 events in the US. This is a huge market. And we want to connect with them with something that works for them. Additionally, validation. We have digital um, devices that we can connect to people. So right now, if you're running or walking for a cause, there's really not a lot of validation. We're able to have people connect and show exactly how many miles they've walked, exactly how many um, uh, laps that they've raced, and have some validation and a much stronger story than they would by just kind of saying, I support. They'd actually have some proof of what it is they've done. How we make money is simple. A 7% transaction fee for all the donations that are enacted on our site. Additionally, we're working with um, companies right now to create a uh, subscription product that will help on the other end with wellness, uh, employee wellness, with large employers who are self-insured to make sure that we give them something to motivate their employees to move and to, and to uh, exercise. What we need, we're looking for $250,000 in equity uh, participation. We're also looking for beta testers. We're opening the site and uh, it's available to be used right now 
we're looking for people to really work with it, break it, please just let us know what are the things that are wrong with the site so that we can improve it. Additionally, we're looking for a chief technology officer to add to the team. So, three things I want you to remember. There's a need. 11 and a half million people in the U.S. alone, in the top 30 events alone, are not being satisfied with what's out there right now. That's what Good Sweat is here to do. There's a niche. Charity sports participants are passionate. They're connected to their cause. And we have something that will really help them out, as well as helping the employers who are trying to uh, incent health and wellness. And right now, there's no clear leader in this market space today. Good Sweat has the offer, it has the brand, it has the commitment that we need right now. Thank you so much for your time. Questions? Oh. Please. Uh, yeah, what's, what exactly do you need the, uh, the 2,500? I mean, Actually, I need 250,000. 250, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although 2,500 wouldn't be bad as well. Um, and what I'm looking for that for is a couple of things. First of all, uh, right now the platform is makes it really, really simple for you to connect um, your social network to your events. But the connection to devices like Fitbits, if anybody's heard of Fitbit or any kind of smartphone application, that hasn't been created yet. We have a minimum viable product, but we want to kind of um, upgrade that product. So it's development. Addition, I'm sorry? Development work. Development work as well as um, getting a two staff members, a, a CTO, and somebody to help with business development. Please. We need more as a not-for-profit and offer it as a free service. Um, is that a little off question? So the question was, would it make more sense to run it as a not-for-profit and offer it as a free service? Good Sweat is designed to offer a lot of value to not-for-profits that are out there, but we're actually um, tackling a pretty big need that uh, corporations have, and actually as individual charity sports participants have. Um, we really believe that we can be the, the next level of employee engagement and employee wellness. <clears throat> We think we can be a lot more innovative in that space than you know somebody with the constraints of a nonprofit uh, designation would have. That being said, we really are interested, obviously, in supporting the nonprofit community, um, and you know as much as we can do to, to lift them up, the better. But we think this is a profitable, profitable business. Richard, define transaction. What's a transaction? Great question. So the thing that makes uh, good sweat run is. Has, has anybody actually ever been contacted or even participated in a, an event for Cure? Have, they walk, have you all walked or swum? Okay. So a transaction is if you invite your social network to support you, if they say, hey, I'm going to give you $100 using the site, that's a transaction and that's what um, So do you, does, does your company, <clears throat> how can, how can you know, walk me through the transaction? I'm, I'm an individual. I came on your site. I want to invest. I, I want to support this. Do I give you the monies that I'm interested in, and you see about giving it to the the person that's doing it or the organization that's doing it, and um, then take your seven percent off of that? That's how it happens. You, though, as the person who's created the event, actually designates who that nonprofit is. We have all the nonprofits with five hundred one c three designations. So you. That's so about the you are EIN. moving the money. We're moving the money from your network to <coughs> to the uh, nonprofit organization. And do they have to reach a certain level? No. So there's no call back of the money. No. Go ahead. Where are your biggest competitors in this space? <laughs> right now, our biggest competitors are the um, the envelope and the piece of paper and the clipboard. You know, the, basically the, the tedious task of going to each friend and saying, hey, can you help me? Making a phone call, hey, can you help me? Right now, um, in the charitable crowdfunding space, much of the um, fundraising that's happening is happening offline, which is unfortunate because if you do fundraising online, you're six times more, you, you raise six times more money than you would kind of offline. So right now, what we're really competing against is um, kind of offline. Now there are other people who are in this space. There are other uh, places where you can kind of get an event um, funded, but there's none that's specifically focusing on actually moving for a cause. And you know, we think that we can be really innovative in having a device agnostic 
way to validate that movement, again, that would help with uh, incentivizing other folks. Go ahead. You have a nonprofit that is not based around um, a sporting event. So, for instance, you want to raise money for a nonprofit, but it wasn't based around a sporting event. Can you still use your site? Absolutely. Everyone with a 501c3 um, can, can definitely connect to it. So, the, the activity is just the mechanism. If you wanted to raise money for your school, that was a 501c3. Or if, if you had a church or, or other kind of um, nonprofit that you wanted to support, the intention is to use that movement to support that thing or that cause. Go ahead. Did they use it for crowdsourcing or funding? I'm sorry, what did you Did they use it for crowdsourcing or funding their time away? Yes, they can. And we think it's a lot more healthy than like, you know, fish fry or, or, or candy sale. Go ahead. So um, I think we will very quickly after we launch in the next couple of weeks, but we're, I can say right now that we have a good partnership with Ascension Health. Okay, largest nonprofit organization, uh, nonprofit health organization in the company, and we're working with them on a population management tool. Thank you all for your questions. Um, interesting background. Doug's the only child of two blind parents. His dad was the longest life survivor of the first group of people ever to receive insulin as a treatment for diabetes. Just think of that history there. Uh, the circumstance of his dad's death is part of why he decided to form this company. When he was 12 years old, he and his mom rode a five-speed bicycle 700 miles from Marquette, Michigan to Montreal, Canada to attend Expo 67. So we talk about the long, slow birth of a new company. He's been there. His rear end and legs know about it. Uh, about the company, um, he and his partner, Jonathan, were senior executives in a company that grew from no revenue to $100 million. So at that point in time, I said, well, what can we do as an encore? Where can we go to leverage our expertise? And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So go ahead, take it away. Well, hello. Thanks for letting me join you this evening. I'm Doug Dormer. Um, I want to talk, uh, as you mentioned, my dad. My dad was the longest living survivor of the first group of people ever to receive insulin. One day in 1960 in Marquette in the Upper Peninsula, where there are two hospitals, he had a reaction, no big deal. But that day they took him to the other hospital where they assumed he was drunk and left him on a gurney to sleep it off, which is where he died. So while the direct cause of his death was diabetes, the real cause of his death was lack of care coordination, lack of health information exchange, lack of patient engagement. Here we are today, 50 years later, dealing finally as an industry with the same subjects. So what I want to talk to you about is that notion we call it patient relationship management, and we think of it as involving these three separate domains, which, as we look at what's going on in the market today, are beginning to converge. And we, with our solution, which we call SPIN, the Secure Personal Information and Notification Network, exists right at the heart at the intersection. Now, I don't have time to go through it quickly, but I will say we spent several years looking closely because we have a lot of competitors broadly in terms of patient portals and EMR systems and personal health records. And we found certain key mistakes that are listed, up, listed on the right here that we could explore. And we then built a process for analyzing care units because care is not like balancing your checkbook. People with diabetes have different needs than people with substance abuse or cancer or pregnancy. And so we built a system and built a platform to support that. We built certain things we call care units, a term we picked up from the University of Michigan, which allows us to use our platform to focus on any set of interests. These are the ones we've worked on so far. These last two we're developing this fall, working with the universe, with Indiana, Purdue University in Indianapolis. This first one, in the interest of time, rather than describe it, let me show you about it. Let me tell you a story about substance abuse. Centerstone is the largest behavioral health care community-based organization in the country. Last year they served over 75,000 people. In all, they operate 22 states. One day last summer in August, they called and said, do you have a care unit for behavioral health? For substance abuse? We said, no, but we know how to make one. 
So we worked, put our team on it from Indiana University. They received a grant from SAMHSA, you can read all the detailed dates, it's up there, a grant from SAMHSA for 840000 put out an RFP, loved our documentation, we won the contract, went live in March. By April 15th, two weeks old, we were featured at the National Council of Community Behavioral Health. On May 15th, we were invited by the National eHealth Collaborative to give a national presentation. By June, we had a deal with the National Council to resell and provide services. And we went on from there. Now the last item up here I'm going to mention, I'll save because that's my close. Quickly, uh, you know, we start with a slide, a standard portal along the way, has some neat things I think. Moderated discussion board. Notice that since they last cleared it, where's the number? Let's see here. Yeah, since we last cleared it a couple weeks ago, we've had over a thousand comments in an ongoing discussion. Before Labor Day, people talking about all the great things and what are we going to do. Talk to someone now, leave a message request a lot of resources. It's just a pretty good site. We also hosted a grand opening with live video presentations linked to Twitter, also with a separate uh, message board for those who wish to remain anonymous. Great tools along the way. I'm going to go really fast here, but we have a dashboard for clinicians to manage their people. We have various online tools, including this health risk assessment tool that's built into it. We have calendars. This would be a patient's landing page. What are my top three priorities in my program? Then you click on those to be able to move the dial, the individual controls of what he's doing. This, by the way, is a mock-up. It's a preliminary one on this particular page. Recovery tools owned by the clinic, personal health record tools because it's bridge to physical health, message center progress, a wonderful solution that's gotten great reviews as we put it in place. From the clinician's perspective, we have a different perspective. How is this individual doing on key metrics over time? What are the summary? What are the data? So that they can manage the population. We also, this in this case, reckon of bringing in diabetes just to bring in a piece of the physical side. Now, I'm almost out of time, so here we go. The real question is, how, what validation is there besides one client? Tomorrow and the next day is a conference for, hosted by the Health, Department of Health and Human Services on this kind of technology. People have received these grants. This is going to be a featured presentation two times over the next two days for the purpose of, because it's one of the top two performing engagements within the community. The goal is to advance this for those that are struggling and to bring new clients to it. That's who we are. Thanks. Questions? Sir, who are your customers? My customers are actually, uh, they're buried on the one slide there, mostly clinic, cl clinics and hospitals. You hear about the term accountable care organizations. It's a new term under the federal government. That's certainly a client group. And we have a fair number of health information exchanges that we work with. Uh, the other way to answer the question is down to the consumer level. Pardon me? You're not going down we don't sell to the consumer, consumer level. level. Here are some of our present direct customers and some of our partners for resellers. Sir? Love interoperability. What about it? Interoperability with other systems that are currently in place. Yeah, we're really good at that. We come from a long background of that, from the financial services, financial practices, and a whole lot in healthcare IT. Uh, some interesting history there with interoperability. I also serve on the HL7 Standards Board, the ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator, and him. So we're really deeply into interoperability as it's evolving. Yeah, because I know there's a lot of issues in that. Yeah, that's why we're right on the edge of it and getting a lot done. Please. How much time are you expecting the clinicians to actually be engaged in the platform? their time is such at a premium, what are you expecting? Let's shift that question. What's the value proposition for providers? If we don't improve operating efficiency for our clients, we fail. We have to do two things. If we have to improve operating efficiency and improve revenue. So really, we're not so much increasing time as we are repra replacing synchronous transactions, talking to someone on the phone, tracking it down, gathering information, with a system that asynchronously automatically gathers information, helps prioritize, so that our goal is to have clinicians see more patients with the same resources and reach patients that they can't otherwise reach. Increased revenue, increased efficiency for providers. Are you linked with uh, a group that does lean or uh, lean processes? Because typically, and I've worked with several organizations that have implemented uh, solutions like this, if they're not, if, they're, if their organization's not moving towards an operational perspective, then no matter what solution they put in there, 
Yeah, and I completely agree. In fact, a very long time ago when I worked at the Rensen for what is now PricewaterhouseCoopers, I co-wrote one of the first books on what was then called diagnosis-relating grouping. So it's a technology that in that stage was intended to optimize efficiency. I know exactly what you're talking about. We work with those consultants, but I would say that is one of the key gating factors. Am I dealing with an organization that is prepared to undertake that or has already determined to undertake it? Sir? Two questions. One, what's your real business model? How are you making the money? Two, how are you uh, with respect to compliance? To what? Compliance. Um, well, there, I have a slide in here uh, that's got the, the financial model. We. We mostly, it's a combination, it's mostly based on subscription fees. Smaller organizations, we charge some services up front. Our preferred model is to say, commit to us for five years, tell us how many people you're going to have, we'll charge you 50 cents to a buck a month, so 12 bucks a year per person. We would like 10% of it up front, 10% when we go live, and then 20% at the start of each of the next year. Per Those person means patient. Per patient that is engaged in the system. Now, that means that on balance, our typical initial transaction is about $150,000 per year. Am I still gone? Am I okay? Go second question? Compliance. Compliance. We do that really well. Um, we spend a lot of it. Again, make about you based on who's looking at you. Yeah. Well, in fact, that's why I say I work on the standards and I work with the ONC and particularly things like security and privacy. That is my background. We also have a compliance officer who comes to us from the... Uh, from the uh, FDA, who's now been working with us for quite a while. So we spend an awful lot on compliance. Nobody's safe. You're always at risk. Have but we do all you can. Compliance audit? No, we haven't. There has not been, that's a longer story than that. A lot of that's going to change when Meaningful Use Stage 2 comes out and they finally give us some standards to get certified to. We don't even have a decent set of standards to get certified to today, which is why I'm helping write them. <laughs> Sir. So does this fulfill that requirement that healthcare providers have to have all their things online? Yeah, meaningful use stage two, this fills in certain key pieces. But I don't think, here's the basic economics. We use grants today so that our clients get out of the risk of making an investment and make sure that the ongoing transaction cost provides sustainability and earned revenue. We're not selling, we do help them meet regulatory compliance, but that's not the core value proposition. The core value proposition is operating more efficiently and making more revenue. Time for one more question. What are you asking for? Let me, well, that one I can't. That is a slide on there. We've raised $850,000, including $225,000 from Ann Arbor Spark, the MEDC. We're looking right now to raise another $500,000. We're doing it the way we've raised our money so far, units of $50,000, 10 units of $50,000. We anticipate two million some point in the future, possibly, but right now, with the hurdles we have, the 500 is our focus. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. We're going to talk really slowly while we switch our tapes here. And Steve is going to make his way up. You can walk really slowly. <laughs> While he's coming up, Steve was awarded Laureate Distinction by Computer World Magazine as part of the annual Search for New Heroes program back in 2003 for the innovative use of some of the technologies he had developed to support SaaS, uh, Application Service Provider ASP Systems. One thing to know about his business, he can create a fully functioning data center in 90 days. Doesn't eat doesn't change his clothes, you don't want to be near on the day 89, but you can get it done in 90 days. Faster than this <laughs> PowerPoint has an embedded video and we're trying to work around that, so it might take one more well, let's get that. Would you do the PDF? Okay, we'll do the PDF and we'll try to run a video at the end if it, uh, if it lets us. Three minutes left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's cool.
Yeah, tell me when you want the video. All right, uh, good afternoon. My name is Steve Jacobs with Velocity Data Centers. Um, in my short five minutes, I'm going to talk to you about what the heck we're talking about with the data center, why we're talking about data centers, how we do what we do, and then, of course, we'll finish up with a Q&A. Last time I gave this presentation, I made the assumption that everyone in the room knew what a data center was. I'm not going to make that assumption today, so if you know what it is, just bear with me for 10 or 15 seconds and we'll get through it. A data center is nothing more than a special building that supplies proper electricity to computer systems. Those computer systems use that electricity and create heat. So the other responsibility of the data center is to remove the heat so that the computer systems operate in an environment that they like. So it's electricity in, heat out, and magic happens in between, and that's all these applications and databases and all this patient connect stuff and all that. So, quick 15 seconds of a data center. Apple has a lot of money. I think we all know that, counting all the Apple devices in the room. They recently built a data center that cost over a billion dollars. So, other organizations, most companies, hospitals, universities, and so on, they have similar needs for this special realm with power and cooling to operate their computer equipment. But they don't have a billion dollars. So what do a lot of them do? They rent space as a tenant in someone else's data center. Perfectly logical choice, unless you're concerned about control and security to your proprietary information, whether it's patient records, engineering drawings, financial data, you name it. If you put it in someone else's building, you're making a decision, and I can go into countless examples of this if you'd like, where you're surrendering some components of control and security of that environment. So what we said is, there's got to be a way to get in the middle. Let's build a data center that's very robust, very hardy, that supplies the right mix of power and cooling. We can build it very quickly, very economically, that allows the customer to retain ownership of the building, put it on their property, so they can look out the window and see it. And they know who goes in it, and they know how to run it. We use a modular building system that I'll talk about here in a second. We also look at the acronym called SCORE. We always want to know what the score is. Security control, ownership, responsibility, and efficiency. We can tell a green story, anyone that wants to save power, we can tell a story on efficiency you can't get in a co-location data center when, when you're a tenant. Why do we talk about data centers? I'm not going to go through all this to conserve time, but during the five minutes that I'm presenting, there's a lot of email flying around the world right now. IBM tells us in the five minutes that I'm presenting, 2.5 quintillion bytes of data a day in my five minutes. I don't even know what that number is. I can't, any mathematicians that can tell us what that number is? Crazy. One last thing for you YouTubers, in the five minutes of my presentation, the equivalent hours of video uploaded to YouTube equal to 130 full-length feature films. We're creating massive data. We need buildings that can put the computer systems in to store that data. That's what we're doing. Why? Here's the other part of the why. Private clouds, I can go in more detail later. Growth, big data, the target story is fantastic. If we get to that at the Q&A, that'd be great. Or afterward, I can talk about that. Research computing, and then our compliance. We have uh, high tech, you guys in healthcare, Ooh, there you go. So here's the video part. Let's see if we can get to this. I thought it play out in the heck. Well, <clears throat> is that the video? Here's a one-minute clip on how we do this. 
built in a factory, shipped in on trucks, set in place in a crane. We built that building in 77 days. A data center in 77 days. Unheard of. So, I have one slide left. It's what do I need? I need everybody in this room to be thinking about data centers for me. I need awareness. We're right at the tipping point. Lots of conversations. We're in sight plane with a major healthcare organization in the area. We've got RFPs, we've got tons of stuff going, but I need more people to know there's a better, faster, quicker way, less expensive way, getting data centers built. If anybody has sales and marketing ideas that they want to bring to me afterwards, I'm, I'm all ears. I want to hear it. So, thank you. <laughs> questions? Lots of questions. Let's start here. Who's your team? Uh, you're looking at it. No, actually, I am the only uh, principal in the business at this point, but I'm supported by um, an engineering team, a full-blown certified engineering team. I in what? All aspects of engineering, civil, mechanical, electrical, uh, structural, you, you name it. Full service engineering team behind the scenes. I have, obviously, I've sourced all of the suppliers. Those are all suppliers that uh, I know and trust. Um, and that's part of that's part of my issue. I'm one man band, and I'm beating all. I'm playing all the instruments, and I can only play all of them part time. So, or you can't. I, I researched data centers for a class project. I, I yeah. heard that it was uh, the direction of the market would be to have the data center in the area that was less cost efficient to people to build their own. But then you could put like on every main street a data center, and all the local businesses would be people there. So you think your model is actually go to the building and build them their own data center. Yeah, our, our model Repeat the question, please. Yeah. Uh, it's something in the effect that how, how, who would use our data center? How is it used? Is so it... You're selling data center as opposed to building a data center and selling space. Correct. We're, so we are selling the entire data center versus a rental model. We're not renting data center space. We're not selling you a data center to allow you to rent space. We're selling you a data center so that your company or your organization can own it and run it privately and put your equipment inside. Let's go back. How, how do you back up the data? Say a tornado wiped out that area, do you have another system to back Great up? Great question. How do we back up the data? In our model, because of our economics, we can build more of these smaller buildings, separated them with, by geography 20 or 30 miles, than you can then you will spend on a single building that has high levels of redundancy. It's called the tier levels. We can build lesser capable buildings, but more of them, spread them out to mitigate the risk across the broader geography. Yep. What do you think? You said it was 115,000 for the rack? That what, was what, what, what Apple spent the rack? in their data center. Okay, so what is, what is your based your cost on a cost per square foot or a cost per rack? Or what, what is your we cost? based our model on economics against the traditional build cost for a more normal data center project, not the Apple project, which is published by the Uptime Institute. They do lots of uh, economic studies on cost per kilowatt. Um, and then we also based our economics against uh, typical rental uh, rates that you would pay in a co-location center. And in both cases, our numbers smoke those. So lots of questions. Let's go back there. In the future, will you ever get into actually um, supplying the hardware, servers, routers. Well, I get into the business of supplying the internal IT payload. No, that's not my focus. That's my background, so I know exactly what needs to happen. But there's lots of people that do that that are far more expertise in that area than I am. So I'm gonna. I, I partner with a lot of organizations to make sure that when the customer says giving me the building is only part of the answer, I need the rest. I bring in my friends and they do the rest. So let's go back here. Go ahead. So you're just delivering the hardware, no services, no software per se. Here's the physical building. Yep. Who scopes that out for you? Well, so who scopes out the building? Um, we have a pre-engineered model. We have commoditized the data center environment. We don't do custom design build projects. If you have a certain size payload, we have two floor plans. You either go into floor plan A or floor plan B. That's how we keep our economics very manageable. We have a standard bill of materials, and that's why we can build it quick. So we have standard floor plans. Just like if you go into a McDonald's, right? There's three or four standard McDonald's. They build them the same everywhere. Steve? Yep. 
calling her. <laughs> uh, just a question in terms of the cost structure. So you've got physical costs of the servers, but yeah. what about the labor used to run that? So you have that all baked in in terms of. I don't run the building. I build the building for you. Yeah, you but take the cost to the folks to rent yeah. space yeah. versus having to have their own and hire all the resources to manage. The vast majority that. of the organizations that will be in this market already have those facility people, real estate people, and IT people on staff. This is not for the onesie twosie servers that are hosting, you know, websites. This is for hospitals, universities, large corporate accounts. They already have those people on staff. So you're not trying to take people who are already off site and bring them back. No. You're trying to just I'm trying to give the CIO a data center faster and less expensive than he can do in any other way to achieve his goals. And when we're done with our project, his facility people and his IT people take ownership of that building and they run it as if we had done a three year traditional build out. Sorry, I'll be around. Thank you. Shannon, are you going to present alone or the whole team? Or? Okay. You have my third person. Good. We have Shannon, Rishi, and Glenn. Um, just a little bit of background. Shin, something about marathons tonight. Shannon also has done a few marathons in her spare time. Uh, Rishi um, was elected to the Manhattan Producers Alliance as an emerging talent. Glenn's a lawyer who served in the Balkans, are the Office of the Special Advisor and the Secretary of State. And with that degree of precise training, he became VP of fashion of the fashion company Perry Ellis in Miami. Strong connection between the Balkans and Perry Ellis in fashion. Good thinking on your feet. Exactly, exactly. shooting, editing, 
animation to post-production of audio mixing to final delivery on DVD were basically a one-stop shop. Um, everything but acting, but even that we have connections to local talent agencies and we can host auditions for you. Uh, what makes us different from everyone else, um, as if you read our backgrounds, we, none of us actually have a traditional um, filmmaking background, but we believe that our diverse array of skills uh, really helps. Uh, Glenn used to be a lawyer, he used to be a vice president of a fashion design company, so he knows stuff. Um, <laughs> Vichy's undergrad, yeah. undergrad is electrical engineering, so he's smart. And I, I was an art student, and I was still in school when we started this, so um, I bring art and you. And, um, <laughs> and lastly, I just want to share this video with you. Um, we did the videos, promotional videos for TEDx U of M, University of Michigan's TEDx conferences. And this is kind of a behind the scenes making of video, and it just shows um, everything that we do with 3D animation, shooting, compositing, and it's just a fun video, so I'll play it with you. Yeah, my question is like, uh, so your staff just consists of you three? Are you expanding? Are they growing? Or what's? Well, it's the three of us. Right. We, we work collaboratively on every project. Uh, when we have an evil, bring in a freelancer. Okay. What would it cost to make a video for uh, crowdfunding? For crowdfunding. So, so this is the most problematic. Well, this is the most problematic part of our business. So, and I'll just preface this: the last time I quoted prices in a, in a meeting like this, somebody came up to Shannon later. A marketing guy came up to Shannon later and said, "You know, we like your work, but we don't take you seriously because your prices are too low." I'm going to stick with our prices, and I'll see if anybody comes up and tells me they're too low. And, I, and I'll and I'll I'll give you the prices, and I'll give you the, the logic behind it. So, a full day of video shooting. For a full crew is thirteen hundred fifty dollars a day. That is low of the mid range of companies our size. So a half day of shooting, divide by half. There's nothing less than a half day. For duration, we're pricing at a thousand dollars per finished video minute. So if you need a three minute video, you're, you're, I'm giving you a ballpark range. Figure it: a thousand dollars per minute plus the shooting costs. 2D animation, you can sort of use those numbers. 3D animation, we're hourly, and it's, it's more expensive. So that sort of gives you an idea. Somewhere in the three to 5,000 range. Um, if we're working at capacity, and we're all putting in eight hours a day, we back out at about $50 an hour, which compared to what I used to charge as a lawyer is a, is a bargain. But, 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 but I'm not in the law business now. This is a different industry. And, it, and, it's, and it's, it's a volatile industry, and prices are coming down. So when we look at our pricing, we say, well, if we're all working eight hours a day, 
300 days a year at $50 an hour. We all go home, none of us rich, but all of us making a nice comfortable living doing something we love doing. Yep. How do you uh, go about finding your clients? Um, it's, it's, it's almost purely word of mouth. You know, you go in and you do a product for some company, some, some group of people, and then someone asks how do they find out about their, their business. And it's, it's, you know, events like this, networking opportunities. Follow-up question, what was your reference for a baseline on your pricing? Uh, we, uh, trial and error, throwing out a price and having their people push back or accept it and then saying, well, we think we can raise the prices. It's very unscientific. And, and I'll say it's funny, I've, I've talked to people in the in this, in this industry, there are very established firms in this area, big studios, 40,000 square foot facilities, asking them, you know, what do you charge? And I'll tell them what I charge, and they'll say, well, they charge a lot more. And I'll say, well, what do you actually get? And they're saying, well, closer to what you're getting. Uh, it, it's, it's, the, the pricing is a mystery. I, I, I wish I could, uh, I could, I could uh, pin this down and be scientific about it. So we're sticking to our pricing for now. I mean, we, our goal is to raise is to raise the prices, but for now, this is where where we think uh, sort of optimal um, pricing for a market. Yeah. Do you see yourself sticking to the services exclusively and just kind of leveraging your talents, or do you want to like productize some kind of technology that can create things kind of programmatically? Um, it's 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 a combination of both. Um, we really really enjoy working on things that we find interesting, and so the, uh, our company is driven by the owners' interests. So all three of us are really, really, you know, interested in the tech communities, the tech markets. We're doing a lot of service right now, but we're certainly open to the idea and exploring ideas for finding out new technologies that we like and videos and animations, you know, related to those. Great networking, I think I told you, Glenn, this is the uh, semi-FX. I think uh, you got your organizer sitting over there. I think it's a great uh, opportunity to kind of meet with people over there in some Southeast Michigan animation and special effects. If you can tell us what to charge, we would be going to charge. I mean, it's, 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 no, no, I mean, what we should charge our clients. We, you know, do, you, do you have a sweet spot client or project, like right now, like what would kind of push you a little bit beyond what you think you're capable of doing? I, I guess that sort of a few projects that, that are sort of we, we really like. We, we've gotten into the um, um, app demonstration. Go ahead. Finish. Oh, do, doing app demos. We, we really like that. Uh, and we're starting to get more into sound design for, for documentaries. And uh, great opportunity for creativity there. Go ahead, Maria. No, go ahead. Yeah, I was just I wanted to know, uh, do you think your work would be considered for like uh, like commercial quality as far as like you say, if, say, say if a customer wanted a, a commercial done for, the, for like something that they wanted to advertise on TV, would y'all would y'all be able to get it to the broadcasting stations to to get out the advertising? Like if y'all wanted a if I wanted a commercial. Yeah, we delivered a thirty second TV spot. And, and that would, you know y'all say y'all charge a thousand dollars per minute, but but that would cost more because because of the broadcasting connection that you would have to get out though, correct? Now I'm talking, I'm talking about like after you shoot the video, and you say oh I got to get it to the broadcasting station to, to, for, so it could be advertised on on a, on a television station. That, that would that would cost more though. Right? Yeah, the, the short answer is um, so we worked for we the client was an ad agency. They told us the, the text, the specs we had to meet. We delivered the product. Everything else was handled by them. Rishi will be working soon on something for a documentary that will is aimed there on PBS. He'll meet their technical specs. Right. Okay. Great. Um, let's go ahead and break here. We're running out of time for this, but I think folks are going to stick around afterwards and we can talk some more. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. That's the official end. Before people take off, um, are there any events coming up that people want to make note of? Roger? Yeah. Um I'm involved with uh, Ignite Ann Arbor, and Ignite Ann Arbor is going to be October 25th. Does everybody know what Ignite is? 20 slides automatically advancing every 15 seconds, five-minute talk. So we have 16 five-minute talks. Um, so we're, we're, uh, at, we're looking for speakers for Ignite number seven in Ann Arbor. 
uh, October 25th. And I'll, I'll send, I'll post a link to a little promo I did for it that will help people get excited about doing it. When's the deadline for submission? Uh, sometime in mid-September. It was, what was the date again? October 25th. It'll be at the Blog of Trying the Business School. Yes, I'm with the Southeast Michigan. I'm with the Southeast Michigan Entrepreneurs Association, and there's going to be an Entrepreneurs Expo on September 22nd at the Southfield Civic Center from noon to 4 p.m. And I have flyers if you're interested in learning more. GLEQ just opened up their entry time for competition in their uh, forthcoming. $100,000 giveaway. Um, I mentioned before the start starting grand opening. It's actually September 14. Starts at noon with a lunch, ends with karaoke at night. It's going to be events all day. It's all on the website. So you, you, you come first punch with karaoke, but you get $5,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Anything then, else? And then the next uh, D New Tech is going to be at uh, at um, at uh, Atomic Object. They're headquartered in Detroit. They're actually, they're based out in you know, the West Coast, but they have an office out here, so they invite us to go come out to their headquarters. So come out. They're going to feed us too. So that's the great thing about it. I've got one. So folks, thank you. Tuesday, September 11th, there's the Detroit Lean Startup Circle meeting at the Dr. Rose. Huh? So folks, thank you all for coming out. Stay and mingle, talk with one another, talk with the speakers, and we'll see you at the next few events.